Hello there everyone, and welcome to Africa, more specifically, Central Africa. If you'd like to read about our country right now, please go right ahead, but we're called, often called, the Jewel of Africa by the citizens of the big old Reich, but there's also more information. So obviously, with, it, with this country here, we're eventually going to have a little conflict with South Africa, probably with a little bit of America, but very cool. And the three mods we're using, obviously, are TNO, the last years of Europe. Player of the Peace Conferences, which means nothing, as well as State Transfer Tool Mod, which really doesn't mean too much as well, but the Pride of Africa. The westernmost Africana show, Rex Commissaria, Zentro Africa, encompasses most of the Congo Basin, once was once called the Congo or the Belgian Congo, and surrounding territories. It is a lush land, ripe with impenetrable jungles, while game and precious resources. A land that beckons to the adventurous man like a siren calling the sailors amidst a tempest. Deadly and beautiful at the same time, you know? It is going to swallow you alive at first chance, but... How can you resist this sweet voice? Rex Kommissar Müller will celebrate this new year of German domination over Africa with a great parade, as he always has done ever since assuming the office. The photos will soon circulate all throughout the Reich, making him even more of a celebrity than he already is. Truly, we are the pride of Africa in every sense of the word. I'm led by Siegfried. How oh, we love Siegfried. If you like to read about him, please go right ahead. We have the National Spirits, the heart of Africa, which looks really, actually really good, plus 25 percent percent construction speed. We have hands-off administration. Not terrible. That's a lot of stability. We have soldiers of fortune, which I think is great. I love soldiers of fortune. And we have... I've boosted up the budget a little bit more. I've not cut down the military budget just because we need probably a lot of production. Actually, I might invest and actually spend more money for our soldiers. But, and we also have a mercenary army with... And we have a trophy room, potentially too, which is I think is awesome. But, confusion in the Congo. I don't understand it, the first officer said. Swatting away mosquitoes as he looked at his map for what seemed to be the millionth time. The lake waters lapped lazily at the shoreline while the wind blew through its swaying reeds. This should be where we set up, is it not? No, 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 said the second, peering over the first shoulder. Look at the terrain. It's different where we're supposed to be. See that cluster of hills over there? There's not there. It's not, it's not there on the map. Behind them, the soldiers of the company took a well-deserved break. The complaints about the bugs waft lazily through the jungle air. We must be in the wrong place. I swear to you, Helmut. The first snapped. I followed the darn map to the letter. Something must be wrong with it. Helmut spots his reply out, as frustrated as Herman was. How would it be the map's fault, Herman? Where were, where were we supposed to be? I was told to go down the road past Mbala and stop when we hit the lake. Mbala, Helmut's eyes widened. Mbala's been underwater for years. How old is that map? Helmut's eyes shot to the top of the paper. He read it twice before angrily crumpling the map and hurling it towards the lake. The jungle laughed as the company drove away. Now, a corporate empire. We could utilize our many investors will be unlocked. The Congo's open for business. The Safari beckons. Ooh. We need to do a corporate empire first. So, this is next. Rex Komosa Mulu is much more interested in hunting wild beasts rather than wasting time running the day-to-day -day administration of Central Africa. However, even he knows that he has obligations to fulfill. Therefore, he has found a productive and lucrative way to secure both his position and his fund. He has declared his Rex Komosa a corporate-friendly administration, leaving German and former Belgian entrepreneurs the chance to seize all resources in the former Congo Basin in exchange for being given, given free reign. The corporates play, pay him handsomely. Part of this money is sent to Germany as part of his obligation as a colonial administrator. Paradoxically, making him the most productive Afrikaner show, Rex Commissar, while the rest goes to fund his love for hunting. While indeed clever, this means that the colonel, uh, the colonial bureaucracy, has become a de facto extension of the corporations. The Leopoldville Parade of 62. Ah, we love parades. Actually, we get how much PP? 0.67. As I write to you, Engal, I am preparing my uniform for this year's Triumph Parade. Well, we call it a parade, but Mueller calls it a trophy hunt, and it looks like one too. We don't even bother with salutes anymore. We, with wild adoration and gushing over the year's biggest conquests are more popular than military icons, perhaps because Mueller and his men cannot run after swastikas or flags and shoot them down. If you described to me how my career here would be would go before I departed for the Congo, I would have laughed in your face, and yet here I am. So weary of it all, I cannot breathe. But this mad laughter bubbles up in my throat, and I cannot contain it. Anyway, the Triumph Parade. Tomorrow at noon, the clocks will ring all over Leopoldville, and a series of large trucks garnished in camouflage decorations, so scandalous it would cause, or be caused for military trial back home, will ride down the Führer's Avenue. Large cutouts will display the biggest hunts of the year. Elephants, monkeys, and the occasional giraffe for when Mueller's gaze strays to Kenya. And TV screens will blare out of this insane circus show to all who care to see it. In fact, I am told it is mandatory viewing in government offices, which would also explain why the offices are so empty this time of year. And this ingull is the worst part. The last part of the parade is not animal but human. Filthy tribesmen they saw fit to capture. Some of them will be still be healthy enough to release when the parade is over, but some will not be. And I can still see the blood stains from last year when I cl collided my eyes. Or collide my eyes. 
We are all criminals now, even if we were innocent in Germany, for they would never dare to do such a thing back home, merely disappear them to preserve public dignity. I cannot forgive myself for what I must do tomorrow, even if you think you can. With yours with love, Hans Schroeder. Now, that's really important, because here, we have to, we have a lot of decisions. We have difficulty, wrap this up to hard mode. I don't, maybe someday I'll play hard mode, but I don't want to do hard mode for now, just because I'm a noob. Not really. I'm not that inexperienced, but... I want to see what it's going to be like by internal situation. Central Africa has grown too grown to rely on soldiers for hire to bolster their forces and do regular security work around the colony. The English under Mad Mike Hoare, the Belgians under Jean Black Jack Schramm, and the French under Bob Dennard, and the various native groups each have their own benefits and their own issues with Miller's government, so much make them untrustworthy. Miller's main goal is to keep these groups happy and to keep them working for him so that he may reap the benefits of the presence. The Belgians provide manpower defense, currently untrustworthy. The French are trustworthy, but they give you a recon and attack. The Anglo mercenaries provides with speed and supply, and native tension is currently low. So we might want to help out the Belgians, but let's come down to the welcome to the heart of Africa. Not only is Rex Commissariat in Central Africa, the wealthiest colony on the continent, it's also a place where all Germans can vacation in. From large jungles to wildlife-filled plains, from mountains to the Great Congo Lake, there's everything a German can dream of in these lands. Of course, all people are welcome here, but there's in the new shimmering colonial settlement on the coast of the lake, Hitlerstadt, we have built a special resort for the finest people. Of course, the waiting list is rather long, so we have the honor to choose our guests, after all. Choosing wisely might give us some favors from the Reich. Currently, nobody, our, our guest in the Hitlerstadt suite is nobody. And we can also ask for resources from Germany. So, we get more resources, which we can actually probably really use. We need aluminum and steel, which we actually should probably get now. Whoa, we have liquid reserves, which is actually really good. So, I could get this down, but let's use the liquid reserves we have now. I do want to boost up civilian spending, because right now we're only on two, which is not great. It's actually not too bad. I like Central, Central Africa. Let's buy some steel. You know what's going to do this? Just do all this. Nice. Debt? Not in my Africa. And actually, what's the production like for guns? It's so bad right now. I want to make more divisions, but it's so bad. I might just boost this up anyways. Um, who do I want to invite, though? I want to invite somebody. Hmm. Albert Speer Jr. Sounds like a lot of fun. He's a, he's not the most expensive. The banker? The slaver. This will please investors. Uh, do we have a modifier for investors? Heart of Africa? Hands off administration? No, we don't. I do want to make sure that the Belgians are somewhat trustworthy, though. So, I like Monstein. Ooh, I kind of want to do Speer, though. The tycoon? You know what? Let's do the Tycoon. Ernst von Siemens is head of Siemens AG, the electronics giant that brings power, telephones, and many other technological and marvels to the nations of the pact. The copper mines of Central Africa will surely interest him. Yay! And I think next we'll try to hire more of these guys, raise the loyalty of these guys. I think that'd be good. We get more manpower, more army XP, which is okay. Encourage plantations. Investors really like this. Encourage well, oil production. Greatly raise native tension. I don't want to piss them off too much. Raise native tension, which is fine. That's actually not too bad. You lose some weekly manpower, but that's okay. Encourage the mining operations. I kind of want to hire these guys because I want to raise their loyalty, though. Sell equipment to these guys. We need more infantry equipment. Greatly raise loyalty. How much? How many guns do we have? Nowhere near the amount that we need. Okay, screw it. Just do that. That's fine. That's not going to help us that much, but... Ernst Siemens arrives in Leipoldville. Jets were through. Though rather graceful in flight, had a tendency to not be nearly so controllable on a rough landing. Sometimes Ernst von Siemens had come to despise over the many years he had headed his corporation. As he stepped under the tarmac, the heat of Africa hit him at once, and despite himself, he could not help but feel a sigh of relief. Germany was always a bit cold for his lucky, and the heat was a welcoming change. I can actually really relate that to that, because when I stepped out of the car when I went to Louisiana, man, that's some solid heat. Miller was waiting for him in a car beside the landing, and they, as they traveled to the hotel, where they could be staying overnight, Ernst got the opportunity to have an interesting conversation for once. Herr Müller was a simple man of exotic tastes, but he was a good conversationalist as well, especially on the subject of natives. Ernst was not really an easily impressed man, but he could not help but admire the efficiency with which Müller utilized the native labor, far better than the rumors coming out of Austria. Africa for sure. Ah, we love Aust Africa. When he reached the hotel and ordered dinner, some native antelope cooked well and spiced, Ernst got the chance to do something so he so rarely indulged in Germany, relaxing the knowledge that tomorrow would be fine. Africa appeals to all, it would seem. Uh, how are the investors? I want to know about the investors. Uh, what do we have over here? Uh, Borman, oh, socks. Whatever. Yeah, ooh, 0 0.67. That's not great. I think I want to do that one, but how are the mercenaries? Anglos, you get more support and motorized. You do get... Mm, what if we raise the loyalty of the French? They're still trustworthy. You get 250, th 250 units of infantry equipment, then you can spend it right there to really raise it. You know what? We might do that. Let's do that one. We, we run... We have a little bit less manpower. 
Uh, but that would help us get rid of our deficit of infantry equipment a little faster so we can do that other stuff. Which is probably the bad idea to do. Whoops, my bad. Whatever. Um, we can do... Ooh. The Safari beckons. Down in Africa. The hub of Africa. Ooh, get more civvies. I like that. Our neighbors. Raise loyalty would be good. We don't need to do that one yet, though. I like to do the Belgians, but we already raised the French stuff anyways. The hub of Africa. With the Suez under Italian control, those ungrateful dudes charge our ships way too much to make trade through the channel a viable economic choice. This means that the only way to reach Africa from Germany is to circumnavigate Spain and the Gulf of Guinea. Guinea. As De Vasco da Gama and other ancient explorers did back in the day, the logical consequence of this is that Central African ports are the closest to the mainland Reich, making us an Africanica trade hub. Yay! While this means lots and lots of money flowing into our colonial coffers, it also means that we have the duty to maintain the large dockyard facilities dotting our short, short camp coastline. If the diamond trade were to suddenly halt due to malfunctioning loading cranes, Mueller would experience a new kind of hunt, one where he's a prey, and the hunter has an atomic arsenal. Cool. Ask investors to finance the civil industry? And we should have gotten new uh, decisions here to, for investors, right? No? Oh! As of right now, the investors are happy. Our relationship with the investors is one built on mutual understanding. This understanding embodies the old saying, you scratch our backs and we'll scratch yours to the fullest extent. We've allowed big business to flourish in our colony, and now it's time for us to reap the benefits of our labor. However, we must tread carefully, lest our advances anger the investors into pulling out of the colony together. Angering the investors will have a negative impact on our economy, and if we anger them too much, they will pull their support from the colony. Oh, wait, you can just get this stuff. This will displace investors. Motorize World War II light tanks. To finance the civil stuff. Um, I don't mind doing this stuff, but I don't want to piss them off, so... And the periods of Pointe Noire. Every time you saw them, they took your breath away. That's what they've been designed to do, after all. For as mighty as the Congo River was, the locks at Pierre Noir demonstrated that the Reich's engineering prowess was mightier. This was the, the face of the Reich's commissariat to the rest of the world, the first and often only site that foreigners came to, who came to the colonies had had of life inside Central Africa. And came they did. In the new deep water piers of the point, flags from around the world could be seen. Most of the smaller ships that piled the canals, moving goods over the locks between the deep water port and the Congo Mare, were locally owned. However, some oddities are bound. A fleet of small Swiss flagged ivory haulers there, three Swedish river cruise, cruise ships there. Conspicuously absent were the Belgian flags that once dominated the river steamers, though many of their vessels and even the crews were largely unchanged. The cargoes they unloaded were much the same too, but every day their desert destination was different, from Valparaiso to Vladivostok and everywhere in between. They were the usual packed freighters, of course, and the ex-Belgians eagerly awaited the arrival of every vessel from the French state, each potentially laden with a whisper of home. Today, a Brazilian reefer ship might dock. Tomorrow, an Argentine Roro ship. Even the frigid trade embargoes among the major power blocks was no impediment. It was easy to find a Panamanian or Liberian flagship owned by an American company or an Indian flag vessel controlled by a Japanese front. As these strangers arrived, they saw slowly meandering currents where once mighty rivers had been, and orderly lines of palatial villas were not but foreboding jungle had stood. And just as the Reich had tamed the wilderness, it seems that commerce had tamed the Reich. With the ports of Central Africa open, the world breathed a collective sigh of hope that the hyper-expansionist Reich of old had committed to a brighter, more peaceful, more profitable future for everyone that is except for the Africans. And that's okay! I, I, you know what? I'm actually, I really like Africa. God, that, that, you know what? Why can't we do this in real life? But, uh, oh, vacation Hitlerstadt. Hitlerstadt was not what Ernst von Siemens had been expecting. He knew of the Congo Resort after all, but in the privacy of his own mind, he had to admit that he had expected a less bleak atmosphere. The waters of the sea were somewhat absent of life, aside from the many birds upon them, and the surrounding brush was absent of many animals. The safari, however, was worth the wait. Mueller was an affable hunting companion, guiding Ernst to the best spots for hunting and the most choice trophies while joking about the inadequacy of some of the native rebels when it came to hiding from helicopters. Ho ho! After several long days, Ernst prepared to return home with a bounty of trophies and a good attitude that seemed to have taken several years' worth of stress off his soul. As he got on the plane, he reflected that he ought to return some time. It was a fun trip. Oh, that's good. Great. But, nah, we can use more civvies still, but that is okay. That is okay. He'll come back. The legacy of Leopold. The Africa as us gods felt something different as they walked in the village for the routine partisan sweep. Most of the villagers scurried and hid as always, but one old man still stood still in the front of his ramshackle house. As a soldier strolled by, he stood at attention, saluted, and shouted, Le Roy La, Loy, la Liberté. Dumb old man, one chuckled, he must think we're still part of Belgium. I know who just you are, boys. All of you forest public dogs are the same, the old man called back, defiance in his voice. Provoked, the SS stormed over to the old man until they were inches from his wizened face. And what makes you think you know us, old man? You don't even know what year it is. Oh, I know all right, he replied. Father tapped rubber veins for old Leopold when the force uh, public gave me this. He had out his left arm and rolled down the sleeve, revealing a gnar gnarled nub of flesh where a hand should be. 
A reminder for my father to work harder, they said. The man who shook my hand was black, but he did it because a white man paid him too, just like you. We're nothing like those dogs, shouted the irate squad leader. The Germans put them in their place. Oh, did they? The old man spat out. Did they? So they? So do they treat the Belgians more like us or more like their own? I still see Belgian judges, Belgian taxmen, Belgian foremen, Belgian officers. Maybe it's the Germans who pay their salaries now, and you're the same too. Different faces, yes, but always the same. Always the white man's mac... Uh, mac uh, the squad leader swung his rifle around and drove the stock into the nosy, shriveled Zack's stomach, doubling him over. The rest of the men joined in with their fists and boots, not stopping until he was a wheezing, bloody ruck on the ground. Sated, the guards swiveled around and stormed out of the village. On to the next one. And what's next? Shipping expansions? Nah, that's not bad. Congo light trading? That's not bad. Increased exploitation? I like that. The Shram deal? Work with Sudvest Africa? Our very own airfields? Clear the jungles? Not a bad idea. Our very own airfields. This will please investors. Oh, oh, would it? Sometimes it's the simple things: the shaking of leaves in the distance, the thumps signifying the end of a mighty beast, the scuffled mobs of a mother clutching her young one. Mueller could hardly remember how many times he had undergone an expedition such as this one, but God did it ever never get tiring. There's always a predator, one which will have fat and con content at the top of the food chain, and there was always a man to challenge whatever animal claimed the throne of king of the jungle this month. That's what he lived for: the hunt. Mueller flashed a devilish grin while the thrill often came from hunting the predator. Mueller was not one to discriminate. The prey was just as valuable. Bringing the binoculars to his eyes, a tattered tan figure in the distance confirmed his suspicions. Rebels lurked in the underbrush. He lifted the scope to his eye and trained on the target in the distance. <clears throat> He bit his lip in concentration. The far distant figure stumbled slowly through the grass, and the pitiful scene brought a frown to the hunter. Hunting wounded animals, no fun at all. Quickly, this devolved from a hunting trip to business, and how he loathed business. He shifted his weight and readied his finger on the trigger. One, two, three, bang! The figure spurt of blood, another success. Mueller grinned as he took his eyes away from... Wait, he fired a second time. The rebel crawled on the sand, still despite blood pouring in two ways. Either this man was resilient, or he... Uh, uh-huh. Mueller appeared closer. His legs hadn't moved at all. How the... Like a zippo snapping open, the things began clicked into place. The bloody lump was no target. No, that went to his buddy using his carcass as a meat shield. Well, I'll be darned, chuckled the hunter under his breath. The jungle follows no laws, but the fittest survival. That Mueller had been duped was a good thing. It meant the prey were learning how to fight like predators do. This, Mueller thought, grinningly, was what he lived for, the hunt. These hunts are going to get much more interesting. Oh, I hope so. I love it. Uh, so let's do the safari beckons too. Rex Komasa Mueller is getting bored, and a bored Mueller means only one thing. A new safari is a matter of time, and it's in the air. The Rex Komasar is cleaning up his gear and filing requests for ammo and fuel for his personal helicopter. From how much he has is questing, this one will be the greatest Central Africa has seen in a long time. Blow the horn, rev up the engines, load the rifles, do a steppen greiser wogen, sind wir hush, uh, hindurch zegogen, gezogen, mit trägen und askari, haya haya safari. Ooh. Oh, we can buy more stuff? Do we have liquid reserves again? Bro, this is awesome. Yeah! And since we're done with that, we still have 287 million. It's not a lot, but I will. I love Africa. Africa's a lot of fun. <laughs> oh, man. At least so far. It's going to probably be really bad later on. But you know what? I don't want to piss off the, the investors. I, mean, I might do this one, but we're okay. We're okay. All right, I you know what? I don't mind trying to get more infantry equipment. We could really use some more, and I want to help out the Belgians. Or oh, we could just do this one. Yeah, we could probably do this one. It's just cheaper to do it like this. Another reliable. <clears throat> In the heart of darkness, after we go ahead and choose. The safari beckons. Oh, yes, please. The portrait of Hermann Sugel still hung in Müller's office. His body was frail and failing, befitting his twilight years, but the brilliance of his triumphal grin was matched only by the radiance of the sunrise in the background. The architect of the heart of Alanthropa project was gazing out upon the Quamouth Dam. The scene was serene and peaceful, a master craftsman basking in the glory of his brainchild, a symbol of Germania's technical triumph. They say a picture is worth a thousand words. This one wasn't worth the canvas it was painted on. In reality, construction of the dam and the series of locks for ships over top of it have been slow and painstaking, while the leading architects of the Reich labored, or labored in Germania or luxuriated in the limelight of the Mediterranean constructing the Le Gibraltar Dam. The remedial students were sent to a virtual exile in this ungodly hot, malaria-ridden crap hole. Progress was slow, mistakes were frequent and often fatal. Native workmen from the flooded zones were forcibly relocated to work on the project. Many dropped dead from exhaustion. Those who evaded capture or deserted only found temporary relief. As the rising waters swallowed the jungles around them, Sogo himself had rarely visited it. Even before his death, most of his more expansive African projects had been abandoned. There was to be no irrigation of the Sahara or Berlin to Cape Town Railway. For the natives, like the Mediterranean counterparts, Alantropa had brought no improvements to the quality of life, only displacement, pain, and death. 
Not so for the engineers. Despite the setbacks, the initial dam provided a vast amount of hydroelectricity and a navigable waterway to connect the brand new Congo Mail the Great the Great Congo Sea, to the ocean. The profits from these projects were enormous, looked down on by their peers in Europe in the flush with cash. The construction team turned their minds to constructing Hitlerstadt, a planned resort community on one of the new islands in the sea. It was meant for the upper echelons of the Reich, or at least those willing to brave the trip out here. And of course, the place was meant for them, a new home far away from their pasts today. As their colleagues in Europe desperately struggled to maintain the failing Mediterranean dams and please their increasingly fickle masters. The Quamoth team kicked up their feet in their new beach front beach villas, watching their kickbacks rise with each passing merchant ship that sails by. So much for nothing new under the sun. More money. Yes. Yes. Now, please investors. I want to please investors. This will displease investors. Clear the jungle. The finance or developments. Now, we're going to do our very own airfields, but do the jungles. Uh, where's the hub? Uh, that's not bad. Raise the load to the Belgians. I do like that. So we need these two, so... Um, let's do the Belgian ones. It's a Schramm deal. Jean Blackjack Schramm is the leader of the Belgian expatriate community. He's an incredibly rich corporate magnate, and he's the most powerful man in Central Africa after merely himself. By keeping contact with the Belgian entrepreneurs who control a large share of the Reichs Commissariat's economy, and ensuring everything runs smoothly, avoiding discontent and accents, he has an important role in the unofficial colonial bureaucracy. Of course, we know that he's a poor excuse for a mafioso, constantly threatening us with the shutdown of all Belgian activities if we don't grant them tax exemptions and other benefits, but even he knows that he can't ask for too much or risk losing everything should we run out of patience. The stalemate is transformed or translated into an informal agreement every year. Schramm and his Müller meet in person and discuss the extent of the benefits the Belgians will enjoy, and what the expatriates will give to the Reich in exchange for the favored treatment. The old deal has expired, so the Reich's Commissar has been invited to the Schramm's mansion for the annual renewal. Afrika, adio, zum bomber. From the outside, the place looks almost surreal or like a practical joke pulled by an architect with far too much free time and poor sense of humor. Just outside of the barbed wire, sneaking around the perimeter of an Air Force base with its hangars and concrete control towers, stood the perfect imitation of a Bavarian brow house, dead in the middle of an arid landscape of the Kalahari. Zumbamer said the sign outside with a picture of a cartoonish pilot drinking an oversized pint of beer while driving its plane in mad circles across the sky. Much like the building, its colors were fading in the dusty wind. Two men armed with cameras and a microphone made their way inside. Uh, ein Film, ja? The airmen laughed with his comrades, all of them looking into the camera, most of them still wearing pilot's clothes, and Luftwaffe crew members each had their own beers and cigarettes, coarsely laughing and smoking in the dimly lit interior. Well, you've come to the right place, said one of them, who seemed to be their leader in a thickly accented English. Right here, you can see the forgotten heroes of the Reich, the proud airmen. We're the ones who save the day in Africa. We're the ones who will remind these dirty black untermenschen when they belong in the Stone Age and will bomb them enough to make sure they go back to it. Everyone laughed, and another round of alcohol was passed around, followed by many others. Many hours passed, and the night fell over the non Namibian desert, thousands of stars lit above, and yet the two filmmakers were still there. Many pilots had gone to sleep, but a few visibly drunk were still in the tavern. Franco on Goletiro, huh? From Italy. I've been there once on vacation when I was on Kin. The pilot smiled, a half smoked cigarette hanging from his lips. I wish I could go I should go uh, I wish I could go on vacation. Sometimes it's just how do you say it in English? A pause followed, the pilot's eyes wandered off in the far distance, a distant rumble was heard, a bomber returning to the runways. Tiring, it feels tiring. The pilot got up, struggling to stay on his feet. I did a mission on a rubble held village yesterday. I've been to the place, there used to be children there. They'll never go on vacation. The pilot smiled dryly before a grimace of disgust appeared on his face as he left the tavern. Time to leave for Central Africa. A meeting with Blackjack and raise the look to the Belgians and the French. Nice. I don't keep some more of the political power for now because we're probably really going to need it. The Anglo mercenaries are currently reliable just like the Belgians. Need attention is low. I want to invite more people here. I think it'd be great if we can invite more people. I know we could cut that, but we're not going to. I want to buy more stuff. Just always buy more stuff. Let's see. Minus 300, almost 300 million. That's so good. Because we're, st we're still out of steel. But everything else is look great. Collapse in the Mboy Mai Diamond Mine. Uh-oh. Rex Commissar Muller took the M30 Luftwaffe drilling out of the box he had set down on the patio table. A combination shotgun and big game rifle was manufactured by Sauer and Son during the Second Bell Krieg as a survival rifle for Luftwaffe bomber crews, if evidently so they could participate in some game hunting as they wasted away in the North African desert. Muller decided to take it out today, see if it performed well as bad as you remember from the when he first tried it out several years ago. He took two. 12 gauge shells and one 3.9 by 74 millimeter round from the box, inserting the shells in the two top barrels and the rim cartridge on the bottom one. Snapping it shut, then he began to wait for a flock of birds to pass overhead for him to test on. They'll be here, he was sure of it. They've been chirping relentlessly this morning as he focused his attention on listening for the birds. He almost missed hearing the clerk running up with a document calling it out. It's from my boy Mai. Without a word. Uh, Muller took a dispatch, took the dispatch from the clerk, panting, explaining, The mine's a total collapse, lots of cow trees. They don't know how bad it is, but. 
God, bad word, bad word it, bellowed, bellowed Mueller. Those bad words at MIBA can't even dig a ditch in their backyards, can they? Now our biggest diamond mine is bad word because they can't even go there three meters underground while well, caving in their own operation. It's all bad word. As to accentuate his point, the M30 went off, launching a round of indeterminate caliber into the trees at the edge of Mueller's property. All that he and the clerk knew was that a large amount of foliage was rustled, causing a number of previously sought-after birds to immediately take flight. This mutual shock allowed Mueller to clear his head. Get that Belgian company on the line and tell them I want answers. He said that clerk agreed and ran off. Belgians really can't do anything right, can they? But they can make waffles. And so reliable. Safari beckons. A meeting with Blackjack and down in Africa. Ah, Siegfried Müller always ha has always been a jovial man by disposition, but the prospect of that day's hunt made him especially happy, as did for planning for every hunt of his life. The man went over his map another time, detailing the game's habit and expected locations. From the re ream of the papers and hand notes, he moved to another table where his equipment for the day rested, lovingly. The Rex Commissar verified every nook and cranny of each weapon's mechanics. The ammo he had had hand-loaded the previous night, carefully calibrating the amount of powder for his rifle and hunting shotgun. From the tools of the hunt, he carried on to the rifle's accoutrement. Water bags, boots, belt, knife, whistles, and field rations. As his preparation progressed, Mueller's nose and ears remembered previous hunts, the smells of the vast African outdoors, the sounds of beasts communicating from one another, the sights of tracks in the dirt and the trees scratched by animals. Each hunt was a kaleidoscope of memories and feelings, and he regretted a bit that his memory could not hold it at all. Even his hunting diaries only carried a faint echo of the glory of his past expeditions. Visiting his diary was the last part of his preparation, and the one he cared for the least. Of course, he treasured the words on paper he found, for they were just another anchor to previous hunts. But the world of paper left him cold, bored, every day. His bureaucrats begged him, begged of him to just read one more document, just sign just one more declaration. Muller pitied the man, or the men in their near suits with tidy glasses. Theirs was a dry world of words and numbers. What really mattered was the thrill, the raw emotion, the fleeting moment where a man could shed off civilization and find the savage joy of the hunt. Muller pitied his bureaucrats, but he was thankful for their dis dedication. How else would he find so much time to keep hunting? Time for a new hunt. Less than a billion in debt. I love this man. Ah, we're being so successful here. I love Africa. Of course, it's not hard mode, so. Then again, that's for the South African where I think, so. Ah, the hunt. By now, the tracking had begun near two days ago. It was difficult to get the big cat away from his pride, but the hunters were patient. This one liked to feast with itself every now and then. It certainly did so with a number of the tribes heard animals. As age wore and his finesse like sand on bone, the village elder had decided to bring his son to this one hunt, ease him into his role for when the old man's spirit departs for the afterlife. And so behind a boulder, both father and son watched the lion yawn, stand and skulk away from the rest, then laid their chance. The old hunter whispered instructions to his son as tense muscles drew his beloved hand-carved bow. It had done him justice in many, many hunts in the past. Today's hunt will be no different. He hefted the arrow his son proffered, eyeing the lion as it drew its aging string in. A loud crack rang out. The majestic lion's blood soaked the sands above its figure. The savannah's piece died with it. A rushing sound followed by a large metal bird descended upon its prey, scarring the lion and antelopes and the strokes away from the watering hole. Only son and father bore witness to the sight of the strange men with strange clothes bursting from the bird's bright red belly. They crowded around the lion's dead lion's carcass, laughing and shouting in stranger tongues. One man stepped forward to hoist the lion's blood-covered neck. In an instant, another formed lightning around from his hands, right onto the beast's head. Instincts regained, the hunter pulled at his son so as they, as they snuck away from the menace that upturned their lives. No matter the all they inspired in the frolic pleasure with which they toyed, the mighty beast's corpse. These men were clearly dangerous, far more dangerous than the creatures he hunts. A world with no prey, only predators. Nice. I will give you some of this. Suppress internal descent. Uh, greatly lower native tension. That's okay. Uh, we, we don't really need to do that. Encourage well production. We can do that one eventually. Oh, slow equipment to the Anglos? What would that do? Greatly raise low to the English. Oh, uh, that's not terrible, actually. That's not really too bad. 15. That's, that's pretty good, actually. Greatly raise loyalty. The English in general do not need much of our aid. They're generally well armed and their trucks are quite up to date. However, everything breaks down eventually, and the British trucks are no exception. By selling the new shiny modern trucks with parts to spare, we'll most likely see their opinion of us approve. That's only 15 PP. And another trustworthy. That's not bad. Not bad. Oh, we can do this one again, but we need more money. We'll do that one next up. The hunting season. Hunting is the ultimate sport, a simple life and death battle of wits and brawn between man and beast. At once brutal and elegant, before he, he even had weapons, it was through the hunt that prim primable, primable men first used his dominance over other animals. Using his superior endurance, man pursued them first to survive them for the sheer thrill. It is this sensation, and the thrill of the hunt and the kill, that Siegfried Müller has himself chased all his life, as of, and now, as the Reichs Commissar of Central Africa. He is surrounded by some of those magnificent and noble opponents on the planet. It would be a pity to let such opportunity go to waste. The current great animals hunted is no beast in the crosshairs. We're hunting chance of success or zero. Meeting with Blackjack. 
The estate is quite possibly the best designed colonial mansion in Central Africa. Elegant, minimalist, after the style so popular amongst the Leopoldville elites, with just, an ex uh, just enough excess to suggesting more, it threatens to outshine the beauty of Mueller's own HQ. Rumors are that the mansion was built with the finest architects in Germany with a prodigious amount of local labor, labor which the owner paid for himself. Mueller's only problem with with it is there's only a fewer trophy heads displayed on its walls than you would like, but Jean Blackjack Schramm, planter, Belgian representative, and real estate magnate is not a man whose tastes stoop to mere hunting. Mueller meets with Schramm on one of the secluded bungalows off the edge of the state, taking care of a little signature for a tax agreement is not something he normally does in person, but he'd be lying if it wasn't at least a little odd and jealous of the Schramm. So he makes small talk with the Schramm, who is of course the very image of polite acquiescence. He didn't get to the top of the cutthroat politics of the Belgian expatriate community through sloppy bearing, and passes him at an appropriate time a paper confirming Belgian loyalty, ownership, limits, and tax revenue. Schramm is a businessman above all else, and he urges Mueller to lighten the load of a class. That is, after all, a key part of the resource extraction operation here. Who else could control the truckloads of jewels and mineral wealth coming out of the basin each day? But even the most powerful businessman in the Congo knows he cannot long resist, af resist the Reich, no matter how far away, and eventually he signs after some minor haggling. The Reich has given, after all, and what it, gives, it can get, take away in a heartbeat. Well, the Belgians are settled for now. Just load us up, because we can get some civvies. If people want to buy our goods, if we have enough of them, people will want to buy stuff from us. So. And we're looking pretty good on steel now, too. Awesome. Blood. Oh, I love blood diamonds. More millets are not bad, but I don't want to do that one yet. I'll see our neighbors. Hmm. Did I read this one already? I don't think so. While Müller is the most well-known among the Rex Commissars, outshining all others due to his near-constant presence on all allowed German tabloids, his hunting expeditions are the constant object, object of propaganda photos, and it seems to smile quite the effect on middle-aged German ladies. He isn't the only one. He'd better never forget this. While isolationist Madagascar doesn't do much except existing nowadays, Sweetfest Africa and Ost Africa are much more pro proactive, and our vicinity to them requires a careful diplomatic approach in order not to cause tensions due to our brothers' peculiar personalities, especially Hutiks. The eventuality of tensions devolving into much worse is more actual than we'd like to admit. Very true. Trouble and Bakuvu. Steiner stooped to enter the bungalow. Inside was Ruckus Commissar Muller with a telegram in one hand, a cigar in the other, and his feet kicked up on a mobile desk. In the corner of the smoke filled room, a wide eyed native boy clutched a tuba and was butchering some piece of Volks, uh, Volkstumilitia, rendering it almost wholly unrecognizable. <laughs> Opposite of him, one of Muller's French chefs set to a more literal sort of butchering, he was hard at work gutting the kudu that Mula had stalked all morning. Steiner took in the scene and realized in a passing moment of lucidity that what fazed him the most was the fact that absolutely none of these sets fazed him in the slightest. Gosh darn those lousy sweets or whatever the heck they still believe in. Mueller slid the telegram to Steiner without even a hello. Steiner skimmed the details of carefully planned rebel assault in Bak uh, Bukavu. 25 Swedish missionaries held for ransom, 7 native policemen died already, and a full-scale hostage crisis underway. Bukavu is on the border with the Aus. This should be Hutik's problem, not ours. Won't he have the men to help, Steiner? All we have left is that far north that far north are the village idiots, and they're all managed to do is get themselves killed. Steiner had a sight for a laugh, passing it off as a cough amid the swirling cigar smoke. Even if Hutig were able to send men, he'd just as sooner order them to shoot the missionaries first. Nordic Aryans who hadn't embraced the Reich, who still looked at Christianity, and worst of all, who still thought the natives had souls to save? If there was a boogeyman that kept Hutig up at night, Steiner Mews, he had to be darn close. I suggest something more discreet, sir. Any official troop movements to the city risk worrying our other clients there, and open the door to rebel action elsewhere, needless to say. The Swedes always pay a sub dollar and on time for protection. Müller ashed his cigar and stood up, walking around the desk to place a hand on Steiner's shoulder. The usual suspects it is, then. Let's send in the commandos. I'm sure you can sort this out, eh? After all, the customer's always right. With a laugh, Müller grabbed his rifle and was out the door to his afternoon hunt in the vast steps. But he had said enough, for Steiner knew just the man for the job. Bob Denner, the Frenchman. The Belgians will be unhappy. Mad Mike, the Brit. Uh, the Belgian. Jimmy Vogelier. Well, who's happy with us right now? If we did raise the... Well, we'll probably piss off the French. We already raised our loyalty once, so piss off the French. Mad Mike, or the Brit. Reliable, trustworthy, trustworthy. Love it. And what's over here? The Mighty Elephant. I, ooh, we do want to hunt stuff, don't we? Ooh, through the jungle. Yeah, I don't do all this stuff, though. I don't do the Belgian connection. What about Hans? There's so much here, man. I love it. The Majestic Giraffe. Our friends in France, across the savannah. Um, these are, some of these are relatively short. The Kudo. Oh, the Gorilla. That seems a bit too much to do first. Maybe the Kudo's easier to do. Across the savannah. 
The savanna covering the northern and eastern parts of Central Africa before it becomes desert are surely filled with interesting prayers, so the Rex Commissar believes. He has mounted a geographical expedition to chart the area still untouched by man, or more precisely, by his helicopter, to find out the, about the more abundant in the wild game. Clear, cleverly for once, he managed to convince the corporate entrepreneurs to pay everything by having prospectors follow the cartographers. Should any new ore vein be discovered, the rights to exploit them will be very lucrative indeed. Oh, we can do a lot of these now. Nice, I like this a lot. And actually, we have... We're actually really good on equipment, except for anti-tank. So, actually not too bad. Really, really good. We could do some of this stuff. Investors will like it. I don't mind doing something like this. Raise native tensions. We could probably do it once. More construction speed. You know what? We'll do it once. Look, the manpower goes down to status quo. Time to collect your paychecks. We've been assigned a sensitive operation from our corporate sponsors. A job that requires a swift armed intervention. While their advisors did not spare much detail, we do know what needs to be done, and that will only be suitable for hired mercenaries to accomplish the task at hand. Thankfully, we have multiple options at hand, all of which can satisfy what has been requested with a more than satisfactory performance. The question in the air is who are we going to deploy and who stays behind? Ah. Oh. We have mercenary corps from the Kingdom of England, the French state, and what used to be Belgium available for the situation. All of them are more than willing to be called for duty a perfect time to fight and inebriate themselves and get paid to do so in fact. It seems as if the other two we don't choose will be disappointed at the lost opportunity. Though we only need one, it's certainly a more enjoyable and better paying activity than what else we normally have to offer them. So whoever we hire is a choice we shouldn't make foolishly. Oh, so this pisses off the other groups. Well, crap. I didn't know that. Uh, we want to raise up the loyalty of the Bel Belgians, so... That didn't do much. Okay. The trouble in Bakuvu, the Mad Max report. There's an old Congo saying that if one watches the Congo River long enough, the bodies of one's enemies will eventually go floating by. When the river proves too slow, Major Hoare is always there to, or Hauer, is always there to hurry things along for the right price. His Unit 5 Commando, affectionately known as Hauer's Hessians, was a motley of all-white mix of Anglos that displaced from Aus Africa and Germans out for loot, glory, or even an honest paycheck. At Steiner's orders, they screamed their way north in a lightning column of kubels and trucks. The men in, were in for a bumpy ride, but it was nothing compared to the heck awaiting the, the rebels in B Bukavu. Shock and awe was the order of the day, and on the arrival, the assault was immediate and overwhelming. But when the rebels finally broke and ran, Hoar immediately ordered his men to cease fire. After all, the more they fled today, the more work there will be for his men in the future. And yet, as always, one or two of the hotheads kept up the fire, eager for one more kill. When the missionaries were freed at last, they rushed out to greet their gallant heroes. The photos of the day would show them hugging and cheering their German-born liberators, but the Harar was too engrossed in his writing to care. He quickly dashed out a short and vague report to Steiner, saving the juiciest details for his memories. memoirs, of course. Today, it might just be his airing troops who were in the spotlight, but he would ensure that years from now, history would remember his work, his word, his deeds, and books. Until then, it was all just another day, and just another paycheck. Ro roll tide roll. Another great day in Africa. Yeah, I definitely want to get Mueller to hunt some stuff. But, you know, let's spend some more. Spend some more. That's okay. After our neighbors, we will do across the savannah, so. That'll be nice. Charting our good savannah hunting sports. Masu across the savannah. The path? Oh, the changing of the garb. Central Africa's native SS units and its infamous mercenaries have always had a strained relationship. Hostility between the two groups is not uncommon. One such indeed incident took place in the town of Demba. A dozen German mercenaries confronted a squad of 20 native soldiers garrisoned in the town, insisting they lay down their arms and allow the mercenaries to take charge of the town's defenses with proper compensation, of course. The natives refused and insisted the Germans leave the town immediately or face imprisonment. They responded to it with a salvo friendly fire. To the mercenaries' surprise, the natives scarcely proved as uh, they, the unmotivated cowards at their ring that are assumed. Rather, they faced well aimed and well spaced shots from a hundred different directions. Two minutes later, four mercenaries lay dead on the streets. The other eight were disarmed and marched at gunpoint to the town jail. The squad sergeant presented his prisoners to the Dembo's garrison captain soon after. He has been expected praise for saving the town from bandits instead. They received scorn from a man whose worst fears had come true. After all, these subhumans had used weapons and training Germany had provided them to murder four members of the master race. Despite facing twenty armed men in his office, the captain told each that they were stripped of their ranks and hung forth forthwith. After a moment of silence, the sergeant drew his pistol and shot the captain's balding head point blank. Demo's German guards were swift, but not swift enough. A running gun battle through the streets left three more Germans and five of the natives dead, as well as eight civilians caught in the crossfire. By the day's end, the remaining fifteen had escaped into the jungle. As his first act days later, the town's garrison and new captain hired the eight German mercenaries into the town's guard. So this is how loyalty is rewarded. Cool. And uh, suppressing terms of sense. Greatly lower native tension. Oh, we can up lower native tension. Oh, we get more stability and manpower? That's 50 political power, which is quite a bit, but that's not bad. I get more manpower, too, and stability. I mean, manpower doesn't really mean too much, but that's okay. Actually, how's construction going now? Four is not too bad. It'll be done by 63, which is not great, but whatever. And can we get some more resources? I want as many resources as possible. Yes, please. If we have enough, then people will buy from us. 
Less than 400 million in national debt. Not even America could say that. Minus 11? Not bad. Really not bad at all. The Alpha kind of shot. Aust. Uh, Aust. Oh, Aust. Oh, Aust. Aust. A proposition. My apologies. My pronunciation is not very good for any language. Every year for the past half decade, we played a simple tango with the Reichskommissar Hutig. We offered to set up a common market with Ost Africa and Sudwest Africa. Schenk, of course, has agreed because sane men agreed to mutually advantageous propositions. Hutig, of course, turns us down every single time because why would he? A common market would imply a free market, and God knows Hutig doesn't want freedom anywhere near his precious colony. In any case, Rolf Steiner is insistent that we tr go try again, and so we shall, but with no hope of success. Prepare a table, Hutig, it's time to dance again, and let us assure you, we're not impressed with your footwork, no matter how consistent it is. We send a pissed-off representative and a dead-eyed adjutant to play this year's dance, and we offer the usual terms. The same purse lips Ost African bureaucrat offers the same response from the same table, unless Ost Africa is given special terms that essentially negate the common part of the market that deals off the table. The representative in his report notes that the quality of the alcohol offered him has declined over the past seven years. He has offered to bring it up at the next meeting in hopes of actually accomplishing something useful. We politely decline. Hutig would probably respond by banning alcohol altogether, and if that were to happen, well, we wouldn't want a representative to try hanging himself over diplomatic minutia. We can barely deal with Hutig intoxicated. We cannot imagine dealing with him sober. We have the same story this year then. Nothing really lost. We get, we'll get increased spending, but nah, I want to do the African one. I mean, I mean technically, they're not really pissed off, so... What else we... will likely attract the attention of investors? I mean, the investors already kind of like us, so I'm not really true. They're happy, so it doesn't really matter too much. And I guess it's status quo, so as long as they're not unhappy, we're okay, so maybe we can abuse them some more first. Synthetic fuel game, we don't really need that. Um, I definitely want to do this one, but we'll do it later. Uh, more research efficiency gain? No. Let's see. Factory output's okay. I want consumer goods. No, there's nothing really here I care about. We lose 250 entry. Oh, that's better, I guess. Uh, I don't know. Maybe we'll invite somebody. Maybe we will invite somebody. And then we'll do our friends in France. Even though the free French remnants vast west of Central Africa are still formally enemies of the Reich, De Gaulle never having accepted the peace treaty declaring the defeat of the Allies, Muller has a personal friend there. Jacques Massou, a general of the French army who served for decades in the French colonial, African colonial troops, and later joined de Gaulle's government in exile. During the war, he and his future Rex Commissar formed a gallant front relationship, each impressed by each other's acumen, and when the war ended, the friendship devolved in, or developed into a brotherhood forged in fire and blood. Even though Muller is regularly kept in touch with his French friend, it might be time to renew the bond in person, and knowing their shared love for hunting, the Rex Commissar knows what might do the trick. Time to buy more goods. And thank you. And we're almost out of debt. I love Central Africa. Charting a good Savannah hunting sports? Very soon. Very, very soon. Ernst and his unit had found what they were looking for. The layer of lawns whose traces they had been deducting for the last hour. He called it a halt and smiled at them. Exactly what the Rex Commissar was hoping for. He called for a map and marked the region on it. Hopefully the others were just as successful. We'll return now. They carefully stole the equipment and silently skulked out of the brass high bushes. Ah, the savannas. Ernst liked it here. Though sweating as if he was not running, not walking, he enjoyed the sound of the sand squash beneath his boots. He was fascinated by the wildlife here and by the sparse vegetation, by the games the Heat was playing here. He liked it, although he didn't exactly know why, but he understood why the Rocks Commissar had sent him here. They took off with the nearly two dozen helicopters from Leopoldville in the same direction, but soon sprayed into different, differing regions. All of them gargantuan helicopters packed with veteran gar garrison troops of the scouting corps to search for the best hunting spots in the region with the best game. It was diverse here, and the general giants from two majestic beasts. They arrived at the position they had agreed upon. While the helicopters had flown off to scout for impressive animals from the sky, several smaller squadrons of three men were to track down the animals on their bases of the pass of the ground, respectively. The other two squadrons seemed lucky as well, and when they arrived at Leopoldville, early the next morning, all but one of the helicopter crews and had numerous markings on their maps. The Rex Commissar was pleased. And the Kudu next. Kudus are solitary animals of the antelope species, though very common and with a preference for fleeing rather than fighting. They're incredibly fast and can run for almost an hour without rest, making them difficult prey to snipe. Also, their long, coiled horns are beautiful. One or two heads would surely make a fine appearance on the fireplaces around Muller's personal mansion. Ooh, very nice. Automobile factory. Von Manstein. Oh, let's keep boosting it up. Boost, boost, boost. We might actually boost this up as well. Uh, you know, we'll do it anyways, because we can. There you go. It doesn't hurt us that much. We got one more factory there, which is not great, but whatever. Things are probably going to fall apart eventually anyway, so whatever. And what else do we have here? Uh, let's see. Mining? Do we get the same event again later on? So they're reliable, trustworthy, trustworthy, which is pretty nice. Pretty darn nice. I do want to hunt that kudu, though. 
Oh, there we go. We need five million dollars. Is that? That's. And we have no more debt. Literally no more debt. Now we can just keep growing our GDP. Beautiful. Just yay, yay. Love it. And get some water now. A formal invitation for General Jacques Massou. Our ex commissar Muller was in a very jovial mood today when he slipped off the dust cakes that had formed at his boots after the morning exercise. He stumped his feet to remove the very last grain of sand and entered his office. He just felt a decision during his morning routine he'd invite his good friend General Jacques Massou for a gregarious hunt, just like the old days. He finally had to pay him back for the cheating at the end of his card game from the last meeting of a Calmer Manor. He'd also had many games with him of fiercer nature for sure. He'd also had a few games of the roughest nature alongside him, but this refers to the game of life and death. Ha, the good old days. Clear in Mueller's memory as ever. How could he forget those days with the man he dubbed my long lost brother? Siegfried Mueller slumped into his chair from the effort of the early morning. Now he'd come to the greatest effort of his. Forming nice words for a neat letter to invite his friend. But he... Craps on the stuff his bureaucrats try to force down his throat. Mueller knows Masu, and Masu knows Mueller. He'd forgive some errors with his French or some more colloquial br brusqueness. He could ask Steiner to check his French after all. But Mueller just wanted to tell his good friend one concise message with a letter back to the good old days. Nice. Our next door neighbor, Shank, through the jungle. I do want to get through this quickly, but Blood Diamond seems really nice. Research projects, mercenary stuff, the Belgian connection. Uh, how, we need to do, clear the jungles. Oh, we need to do that one though. Ooh. We're gonna do this one. Construct infrastructure. Raise loyalty to the Belgians. Ooh. I don't know. We'll come back to that one then. You get two more civvies. I do like that. Uh, Congo Lake Trading. The Congo Lake is a very recent addition to the world's geography, courtesy of the artificial Congo River Dam. While the cost of native lives and environmental damage has been high, the lake has opened new, unexplored avenues of trade, and that's what Mueller's corporate friends want. But the lake was created, a all goods needed to pass through dirt roads and obsolete railways cutting through the jungle, always needing repairs due to the adverse weather, and in constant danger of being assaulted by bandits or rebels. Now it's possible to exploit the lake and establish safe shipping routes, cutting transport times and costs, and making the colonial administrator administration richer than ever. Which we love, 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 love. 55%? Okay. That's good. The kudu, the equipment. Anything else here? No, not yet. Nice. Muller entered his personal armory. Now that he knew where he was going, he wanted to choose his equipment. This was one of the quintessential parts of the hunt. Though boring to the onlookers, I, Muller, found some joy in it. There was always the option to choose from the classical hunting equipment, used decades ago from being just as effective back then. It consisted of older weaponry, something that Muller's grandfather might have fought with, yet it was reliable as it could not only include knives, but also the devices used in ancient times to read an animal's tracks. But it could also choose from modern hunting weaponry. It relied on a range of the newest support devices to make for the perfect kill. It was impressive, heavy, and efficient. However, the modern equipment greatly differed from the older, as it lacked its all-arounder abilities. Yet the old equipment often failed to make a hunt swift and effective, with robust uh, animals often escaping before the deadly shot. Miller now wanted what he could slay with such a filigree and nimble animal like the kudu with. On the other hand, he also had to keep in mind how intend he intended to kill the beast as to not bring him down with the wrong armory. Old and reliable modern swift. Um, well, with the kudu, it's very fast. It's a very fast animal. So, old... Devices use ancient times to read an animal's tracks. It's only if it moves is it fast. So if you're fast, if you're careful enough, you'll do okay. But modern and swift is heavy, right? Impressive, heavy, and efficient. Now, we don't want to be heavy, right? But it's efficient, though. Um, if you don't scare it off, then the old ways are probably better. Hmm. I don't know. This is a tough. This is a tough decision. Failed. The old equipment would often fail to make a hunt swift and effective, with the robust animals often escaping for the deadly shot. So that sounds like we should go modern and swift. The kudu, the hunting sport or hunting spot. Muller was lying on the ter terrace of the Rex Commissar's palace to enjoy the cool evening breeze as a division, a diversion from his usual evening routine. He didn't return early to the adjacent place today, or palace today, because he was still wondering about earlier on how to expand his trophy collection from one floor down. He finally knew how. A kudu. Savannah animals famed for the exalted appearance thanks to their impressive cornets. Sometimes m man tall colossi of horns that shaped it into slight springs for the whole outward appearance. Muller used to call them Africa's deer with uncomplex and more impressive co cornets. In his office, he pondered over the map where every mark his scouts had made were centralized for posterity. He swiftly identified the two spots he preferred for the plentifulness of the animal he had to choose. On the one hand, there was a border territory of the lower Chad Savannah, crossing directly into the region, frequently bombed by Windhoek. 
But so close to his own territory, no bombardments were conducted there. Well, he could ask for the bombings that would be stopped in the Chad region. Yet the savannah there made for the animals preferred terrain and thus for a hunting spot. On the other hand, the Kunin province, located deep in a Rex Commissar Sudwest Africa Center, a flight that could be equally long and satisfying. His fellow Rex Commissar surely wouldn't mind him hunting there. Besides, someone had to keep his friend's wild wildlife in check. He had now had to choose where he could stop to find the most impressive game and where he would have the most luck to, with the kudus. Just in case, let's save it, because I want to make sure we're successful at least on the first one. So, thank you. Uh, what do we want to do? So what do we have? Kudu undecided 58% chance of success. Um, ooh. On the lower Chad Savannah, bombing from Windhoek. But so close to his own territory, no bombardments were conducted. He has to be stopped. Well, let's go lower area. 63% chance the hunt is ready. Müller took his leave of Rolf Steiner, entrusting him with the necessary authorities for the time of the Reichskommissar's absence. He then greeted his neatly assembled hunting crew beyond the confinements of the governing complex. A veteran of the garrison, two natives of the Waffen SS, a mercenary familiar with the hunting spots, and a local path tracker, whose reputation even impressed Müller's scouting corps. They made themselves comfortable in the Grand Helicopter's cabin, however. His companions weren't quite so comfortable with so many different ethnicities and nationalities in one vehicle. Well, at least Müller hoped they wouldn't hamper his hunt. In spite of everything, this was ready. The Rex Commissar rubbed his hands at the thought of slaying a beautiful kudu soon. He pictured it right in front of him, aiming at the gentle creature and directly hitting it through its heart. Uh, him approaching after the deadly blow, fascinated by the sublime shape of the cornets. However, he had told himself back despite his glee of finally hunting again, for the hunt merely beckoned we're on again. Oh crap, please. 63%. Uh, the kudu going to Savannah. We're closing in, Rex Commissar, finally. The words pilot saved him from completely drifting into his he heaven of hunts. Excitedly, he grabbed for the supporting bars and positioned himself on the skids, when windy air blowing along his face. Below the, lay the treetops of the jungle, the helicopter's silhouette skating across the foliage canopy to its destination. The helicopter soared. Ahead was a patchwork of brush and grass. This was what he had formerly been known as the lower area of Chad, known as the wetter spot of an infamously dry colony. This area held a small amount of rainforest that fed into the Congo Delta. But they weren't there for that. They were there for the woodland savanna and deciduous forests that were just to the north. There they could find a kudu with nice horns to poach. One of his companions joined him on the skirt, or on the skids, shouting despite the noise. How do you want to proceed? You seem to have gathered the essential details about the spot by now. The kudu are obviously in the grass. That's a fine question to be sure. Should they fly lower for a closer look, or will that give away the element of surprise? The hunt might just be sad in this instance. Keep it high to surprise them? Take it down, we need a better look. Um, we to, went with the new equipment, so we can go higher, right? And Jacques accepted our invitation. The Rex Commissar just hopped off this helicopter when one of his bureaucrats approached. While on the hunt? Mueller just couldn't hold back his laugh how the old man's oversized suit rippled in the wind created by the helicopter. He was really struggling to hold all those papers in his hands against the ro strong rotors. Mueller released him from the struggle by laying a firm hand on one shoulder and leading him to a calmer corner. He patted the man's shoulders, leaving a dusty mark on the suit he scornfully glanced at through his fogged glasses. Mueller made him hold his two rifles in one substitute, just in case to exchange them for the paper. He never thought to do that, but he glanced at a distinctive stamp during the walk. Siegfried Mueller clamped all the unimportant notes between his legs and read the letter that concerned him the most. General Jacques Massou's reply was as fast as, as if shot by a piece of artillery from the French remains all the way to Leopoldville. And just as swiftly did Mueller read the letter. Bad word Massou and these elaborate words of his. Ha! There it was, the answer he needed, all the validation he wanted. Massou and he would soon join up as as in the vein of the Brotherhood's formation during the Cameroon conflict. It was all coming back so fast, and it was so good. His joy for the day was probably doubled for all to see. The grin just would never completely vanish for the whole of the day. The laughing man's hopes and wishes always come true. He's such a character, such a character. We love Mueller. The perfect occasion. Siegfried Mueller neatly prepared his rifle with meticulous movement. He didn't want all this neat planning for all these efforts for the nonce. He was concentrated as ever when he was hunting, pulling up the weapon and starting to arm... Uh, the crosshairs becoming but an extension of his eyeball. There it was, satisfaction set in, yet he couldn't rest on the accomplishment, yet there's no mercy for the wicked. In a group of the four, the kudus were grazing on the confined scrap of savannah grass. The graceful body of one of them appeared in the crosshairs. He went to the right and found his head. He hovered over the noble animal and with his reticle for some time. His cornets were amazing, huge, and impressive, just as he had hoped. He had his desired target. The other kudus were of no concern to him. Their horns were still developing. He, should his companions concern themselves with him, he would go for this one. One last adjustment. He was ready. He started counting down in his head like always. Three. He held his breath. Two. He closed his eyes. One. And he shot. God, I hope it's successful, man. I really hope it's successful.
We missed it! No! The shot miserably missed the animal! The animal immediately took flight after confused looks. Startled, the whole group took on the same pattern. Confused looks first, then the flight. The same went for Muller and his companions. Confused look at the Rex Commissar first. A useless waste of ammo thereafter. They tried their best to slay at least one of the Kudus while they penetrated some of them. There was no coordination amongst the hunters, allowing them to all flee in the end, bloody but unbowed. It was too late. All of them were gone by the bushes. Nonetheless, they searched for them while on the ground, yet hadn't any luck with it either. Muller just didn't want to return empty hands. And in his anger, he sent his hunting blade spinning in the air for countless meters. Yes, he had slain some kudus before, but that brought him no closer to possessing the cornets in his collection. Forced to make his peace with not slaying the skipped animal on this unlucky day, he took hold of his senses again. While they returned to the helicopter to fly off again, he swore to task some mercenary commander with bringing him the most impressive kudu horn sometime in the future. Sometimes you can't do everything yourself. Now, I do want to see what this event is like. So, let's see what the event is like. And, and then it will go back and be successful. Miller marked the spot they had just lost the impressive game in. He wanted to have the spot marked for when he decided to send the mercenaries and bring him these sublime cornets. Mueller felt the ambition still flickering in him, but also reminded himself how much other imposing game roared Africa, roamed Africa, potentially fulfilling his dream of a grand trophy collection. On the way back, they encountered some of Shanks' Luftwaffe squadron. They made, this made Mueller happy. He, he didn't know why. It simply did, probably because it reminded him there were other things than just hunting. There were things like friends, drinking, eating, and governing? But we'll see when we are actually successful. All right, everyone. So I couldn't figure out how to actually get it to be successful. I've tried like 10 times off screen doing the basically same thing over and over again. But if you have any ideas on how we can improve our chances of getting this completed, because we're our two-thirds percentage of getting it completed, please let me know because I would like to have the Kudu event actually successful for us. But I think we'll end this episode here. But before we go, please let me know in the comments below. Should we do our very own airfields, expand the Leopold Airport, as well as Road to Kab Kabinda? Or should we do work with Sudwest Africa, clear the jungles, and improve the relations we do have with the Belgians? Please let me know in the comments below. And apparently I did look off screen. And I think to do this hunting stuff, we got to rush through this side before South Africa, the South African War explodes. So, regardless... If you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow as we continue on with Rex Commissariat of Central Africa, and have a great time hunting all sorts of animals. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.